It really is a privilege to be chairing uh, this uh, session. I spoke uh, yesterday at length in my speech, most of it about money. Well, we've got the man who's in charge of the money <laughs> at the Ministry of Community Housing uh, and Local Governments, uh, who uh, really has uh, devoted an enormous amount of his, amount of his time uh, and brain power in getting his brain round the complexities of local government finances. We've been steeped in it for many years. Rishi came in as the new boy uh, in very, and in very short order uh, had really mastered uh, that, uh, uh, the art of local government finance and understanding uh, the complexities and I would say the unfairnesses in the current system. And I know Rishi is absolutely determined uh, to arrive at a conclusion that is as simple as possible, uh, but is fair, and gives local authorities of all shapes and sizes uh, a, uh, a, sen a sensible allocation that is evidence-based. And yesterday I talked about the work we're doing uh, with PwC, a big piece of work, uh, establishing the evidence of the cost drivers and demand uh, and pressures uh, facing uh, all sectors of local government, and most importantly, how the county councils compare to those others. Because I said yesterday, I said briefly again, for Rishi's benefit, that uh, I genuinely believe uh, that if it's played with a straight bat, it is fair and as simple as is possible uh, that counties will get a bigger slice of the cake. So it's my very great privilege to uh, pass over uh, to Rishi. We couldn't have a more able uh, and capable friend uh, in the ministry uh, sorting out uh, this big conundrum that hopefully uh, will give us uh, a sufficiency and sustainable financing for the future. Rishi, a very warm welcome. Thank you. Oh, well, good, good morning, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you here today. And as I should say, I guess, congratulations for making it here the morning after the night before. So thanks for all being here bright and early. It's, uh, you know, it's my first, it, I realize it's my first CCN conference, so it is a special pleasure to be here. And I was reflecting back to January when I was first appointed as local government minister. And it was obviously my first ministerial job, so you make that transition from being a backbencher to joining the government. And it does, uh, it does make you think about who your boss now is going to be. Because obviously, you know, as a, an MP, it was pretty clear uh, my, my boss was the people of Richmond in my constituency. But now, as a minister and a member of the government, who was I answering to? Now, some would tell me, well, of course, it's your Secretary of State. Uh, some said to me, well, no, no, it's the Prime Minister. But very quickly on the job, I realized that my real boss was going to be this chap called Paul Carter. <laughs> but in, in seriousness, it's been, a real, it's been a real pleasure getting to know Paul and, and the rest of you over the past several months. And I'm very grateful for everything that you do to make the case for counties in Westminster. You know, so thank you to you, your team, and everyone else at the CCN uh, for continuing with that uh, fantastic and very valuable effort. And it's been a genuine pleasure working together over the past few months. Now, I read, I read an article recently actually making a powerful case for strong local government. And the article compared you know, national politicians and ministers like me to generals in a Tolstoy novel. And it said we moved pieces around the board while the actual battle is nothing like they imagine. And that very much struck a chord with me. Now, even as a, I hope, very good constituency MP, I've always been very envious of the incredible, tangible, and direct impact that you all have on people's everyday lives. There are simply hundreds of services that you have to provide. From social care and children's services, to broadband and highways, from trading standards and weddings to blue badges and fostering. And you do all of this for 26 million people across 86% of our country's land mass and across half of England's economy. When you think about it, it really is an incredible responsibility. And I am the first to recognize that you've been delivering these services in what has been a very difficult financial climate. I think it's fair to say that no other part of government has carried a greater share of the burden in improving the country's public finances. You are very much on the front line, and you have shown unmatched leadership and creativity in delivering high-quality services over the past several years. And I pay tribute to your work in this regard. 
I'm genuinely honored to be your champion in government. And today, I thought I'd spend my time to touch on three themes about why I'm incredibly optimistic about what the future holds for county councils. Firstly, to talk about the new fairer funding system. Secondly, to touch on the crucial role that you have to drive social mobility in our country. And finally, the vital part you play in helping our society's most vulnerable. Now, Isaac Newton once said that nature is pleased with simplicity. I think then that we can safely assume that nature would not be that pleased with the existing local government finance formula. I very much want our county councils to be on a solid and fair financial footing for the future. And we can't do that without a new formula that is more accurate, simpler, and fairer. And I can assure you that introducing this new formula is among my highest priorities. The opportunity for such a comprehensive, fresh look like this doesn't come that often. So I am clear, we absolutely have to get this right. And that's why I'm extremely grateful for the thoughtful and detailed contributions that many of you and the CCN have already made to the department. I've spent a lot of time reflecting on the issues that you've been absolutely right to highlight to us. And I just wanted to touch on a couple in particular. Deprivation. To suggest that vast areas of the country that you represent have no pockets of deprivation simply isn't a reflection of reality. So it is right that any new funding formula must recognize deprivation at a more local, individual level. It isn't something that just happens in big cities. Also, we are all too well aware that our country's demographics are changing far faster than the designers of the current formula may have even thought possible, and particularly in your county areas. So the new formula must be smarter at keeping track of our rapidly changing population, giving a realistic, up-to-date picture of the pressures driving actual expenditure on the ground. And nor will the formula overlook how rurality creates challenges for service delivery. Now, my own constituency in North Yorkshire has a county division with more sheep than people. And while this new formula is unlikely to accurately capture the sheep population, it certainly should deal with the genuine cost of delivering services in more rural areas. I'm pleased to say that we will publish the latest round of our consultation shortly ahead of implementation in the year 2020-2021. And I am confident that a simpler formula which recognizes relative needs and resources much more fairly than ever before is a prize that is now finally within our reach. I'm very passionate about ensuring that everybody, no matter what their background, has the opportunity to fulfill their potential. A fair chance to build a good life for themselves regardless of their family circumstances or where they came from. Spreading opportunity and unlocking the enormous potential of our people, that's why I came into politics, and I'm sure it's the same for many of you sitting in this room. But like almost every area of public policy, without local government, this ambition simply can't be realized. So I'd like to thank you sincerely for all your work on the Social Mobility in Counties report. The report was absolutely right to highlight that social mobility is a particular issue for our counties. And there is, of course, no one silver bullet. But the work that you are doing every day is making strides towards a more socially mobile society, providing the transport networks that a young apprentice might use to travel to their work placement, equipping them with the skills they need for a successful career. Rolling out the high-speed broadband that an entrepreneur will use to start a successful business and increase local employment. Or investing in nursery provision to ensure high take-up of early years education, so crucial for a child's development. 
at every step of the journey for a person to fulfill their potential, you all are there. And so I commend the CCN for using its powerful voice to show both your commitment to social mobility and your willingness and capability to make it reality. As the Secretary of State rightly said at the report's launch, the government will look closely at the recommendations you have made to see how best we can empower you to do more. It is clear that when it comes to spreading opportunity, you all have a vital role to play. And I am delighted that you have made it such a priority, and I look forward to backing all of your ambitions. Now, of course, it is exciting and inspiring to talk about how you are all helping to help people achieve success. But we should also remember that yours are the first hands that reach out to those who fall on hard times. You are the front line of how we treat the most vulnerable in our society. It is a really daunting responsibility that you shoulder, but you never let us down, and I thank you for all your work. But the important work that you do isn't just about fixing the problems of today. I'm more ambitious than that, and I know that you are too. At this very moment, your key workers are helping to bring stability to the lives of tens of thousands of families dealing with multiple complex issues through the Troubled Families Program. Now, my first visit as a minister was spending time with some of the families that the program has helped, and it is experience that I will never forget. This revolutionary way of working, this whole family support, has saved children from going into care. It has helped people find the dignity and security of employment, and it has ensured that families stay strong and stay together. It is a testament to how your intervention today prevents problems tomorrow. And I want your councils to be free to innovate and tackle problems before they even arise. And so as the spending review approaches, I think we collectively need to think about how best your councils can be resourced to invest in prevention. I'm passionate about learning from all of you how central government can best support your aspirations in this area. Because your track record already shows us that you can make a major difference. And if we can get this right in the future, working together, we can truly transform the lives of tens of thousands of the most vulnerable people in our society. And that really would be something to be enormously proud of. And so, while the intense debate may continue to rage at Westminster and dominate the headlines, I know that you will go on delivering for your 26 million constituents, ensuring that their communities are enriching places to call home. And I've always seen my role as being your champion in government. Now, of course, my voice is one of many, so I can't promise that we will win every argument. But I can promise you that I will keep making your case. And I genuinely believe that the concerns of local government are being listened to now more than ever. And I hope that the recent announcements in the budget were a clear sign that this approach is working. And if we can get this right in the future, I'm incredibly positive about all the good that we can do. So in conclusion, I'm very proud to be your champion. I'm humbled by seeing everything that you've achieved. And I'm enormously excited about what we can achieve working together in the future, ensuring that our communities and our constituents can look forward to a safer, brighter, and more prosperous future. Thank you. Right now, I'm pleased to say Rishi is uh, pleased to take uh, questions. We've got about 20 minutes. If uh, uh, delegates could say who they are and where they're from, 
would be really good. The only rule is we don't want to talk about Brexit because we've got, Ke <laughs> we got Kevin Bentley doing all of that later this morning, which we're all looking forward to greatly. Uh, but, so let's get on with the job. 20, 25 minutes, all right, with you, Brilliant. Richie? Yeah. Right, uh, I saw Roy first, then Byron. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was so bright, I couldn't see it. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Byron Rhodes, uh, Leicestershire. Um, Matt Rishi before, and what a pleasure it is to hear you this morning. And thank you very much for a very fine speech. Uh, just talking about the fair funding, um, we're all very keen to see what that formula is going to look like so we can do the exemplifications and look forward, because we have very little vis visibility um, of the position after March 2020 in planning our budgets. And it's given us a real problem now as we get closer and closer to that. So if you could tell us or give us some idea of when that will be, so that we, I'm talking about things when we can actually do some calculations, mm -hmm. that will help. And the other thing I just wanted to mention to you, there are, there are things happening now which mean that, ha that the formula has to be really dynamic. What's catching us up um, on what surprised us a little bit over the last year, year or so is the rise in the number of SEN children which has come about from changes in the assessment arrangements, which is bearing down not only on the direct schools grant, which could overspill into our budgets, but also on SEN transport. If you could give us some encouragement that the formula will be sufficiently dynamic to deal with problems like that. Pat Barnes, you pass the microphone to Roy, and we'll take two at a time. Thank you. Good morning. Roy Perry, leader, Hampshire County Council. And I won't bore you again, Rishi, with my view that you should give councils a little bit more discretion to make modest charges for services that enable us to keep some buses and keep uh, amenity sites open. But I'd like to pick your brains. I've got a question next week at the full council meeting that, from an opposition member saying, has austerity ended? Can you give me some clues on the reply? <laughs> Right, okay, brilliant. Uh, right, Byron, thank you very much. And I, you know, all, I'm very lucky in this job to have engaged you know, members of the local government family you know, who are really helping with this fair funding review. And I think in Byron, you're very lucky. And in Leicestershire, more generally, you've got a council that actually was going to do the job for me and produce their own formula, uh, which I thought, brilliant. I can just, you know, pack up and go home. But uh, no, it's been, it's been really good to have those very detailed conversations, Byron, with you and, and your team. And to touch on these, these topics, uh, you know, there were a few different ones. I think the, the first thing in terms of timeline and visibility, you're absolutely right. I, you know, we need to try and get this done as quickly as we can whilst getting it done properly so that you all uh, sooner rather than later know what's happening. It's what the plan is, is you know, relatively soon, you know, I would imagine before the end of the year, the next round of the consultation will be issued. What that will be is a further kind of narrowing down of the set of options that you've already responded to. So I think it will have the structure, the broad structure of the formula. As you remember from the last one, we talked about a foundation formula, and then we talked about you know, a, a handful of service-specific formulas. We asked you which ones you thought those should be, how we should structure those. So it will talk a little bit more about that and narrow down, uh, narrow down the decision process. It will start to talk about the individual cost drivers within those several formulas and get your views on those. And then it will have a section talking about how we should deal with resources as well, because remember this is a, a look at the relative needs and resources uh, of all local government. So from that, you know, as be fair to say, I think it would be hard from that to go to then figure out exactly what that means for your council, you know, to the pound. I think wh when that will happen is after, I'd say, late spring next year, you will then get the indicative formula. So after we've got all your views on this next round, and then we can narrow it down some more and actually just settle on a formula, settle on the cost drivers, th at that point we could publish an indicative formula. Hopefully the spending review will have happened around the same time, which will be good to have these conversations in the round. And then at that point we can publish indicative numbers is the plan. Um, and then obviously when we get to this time next year, as normal, we would do the provisional local government settlement. Uh, but in general, I, I very much appreciate you know, your desire to have as much certainty as early as possible. I know it's not months, but hopefully this year the local government settlement will come a little bit earlier than it normally does, which is something all of you said to me in the first few weeks I've had the job, and we've tried to do what we can, working with Treasury and other parts of government to bring it forward. You know, as I said, it's not months, but it's at least a few weeks better than uh, it normally would be. And then, and to pick up on the last point about the 
the formula being dynamic. I mean, absolutely. I mean, when I talk to all of you about you know, what's happening on the ground, you talk about SEN being one example, but generally you know, there's, a, there's a small group of very elderly, very complicated people in adult social care that account for a huge proportion of the spend for many of you. It's making sure that we're using population projections or some ability to keep up with this rising demand that you're, you're facing on the ground. Uh, with regard to that SEN point in particular, I would tell you that you know, that was something that was raised with me by you know by Paul in our meetings and by my own council as well. I'm sure Carla's here somewhere, uh, and it's something that both the Secretary of State and I have flagged with DfE. And I know obviously in many parts of the country, people are talking to their schools forum and shifting the 0.5 percent over from mainstream to SEN. Uh, but clearly, there's a growing pressure more generally there. You know, and I'm I'm keen to ensure that when we give you funding to finance local government that should be spent on local government services. And the money that you get from DFE for dealing with mainstream and special ed should be sufficient for that purpose. So I want to make sure that everyone is aware of the pressures there. So those conversations are already happening. Uh, Roy, thank you for banging the drum for more autonomy. And keep doing it, please. And all of you, you know, talk to your MPs when you see them about that. I think it's a very fair and valid point that you make. I, in general, am instinctively a localist. I generally believe in trying to give you as much power and autonomy and flexibility as, as I am able to do. And clearly, when we get to the spending review, you know, those are the kind of questions that we should be considering. Because I think, for, uh, for me, I view the spending review not just an opportunity to sit there and figure out what local government needs this amount of money, and that's all it is, and here's the check. You know, we should, it gives us an opportunity to think about local government more strategically. You know, what is it that you want to achieve? What is it we think uh, we need to do to help you meet those aspirations and, and having more autonomy, more power, freedom, flexibility should very much be part of that conversation. Um, so don't, don't shy away from coming up with suggestions. Obviously, you've got one. You, we, people have talked to me about bus passes. You know, people in other areas talk to me about hotel levies, all sorts of things. I'm not saying whether I agree with any of them or not, but those very much should be part of the conversation. Uh, and in terms of you know, this austerity in general, as I said, you know, I, I think this was a very good budget for local government. And obviously, there have been pressures over the past few years. You've coped admirably in the circumstances. It's harder every year to find incremental efficiency. I, I get that. And you know, this was a budget you know, where there was a substantial hundreds of million pound investment tackling the things that you have told us are you know, most worrying for you, adult social care, children's social care uh, being top of the list. But beyond that, I thought there was a great vote of confidence in local government's ability to deliver. Uh, you know, I, the High Streets Fund is you know, a very significant program, you know, 700 million pounds, and it will be all of you working with all your other local government partners who are going to be the ones accessing that fund, taking responsibility from ensuring that your local community is a vibrant, thriving economic place to be. And I thought that was a good statement of confidence in local government. And I get, we, again, we get caught up, people are always interested in the money, but I think actually attitudes and values are also important. So I think there's been good improvement on the money, whether it's social care, potholes, or high streets, uh, and that conversation, I said, positions us well for the spending review. But beyond that, it hopefully is taken as a big vote of confidence in what you all are able to deliver. And I, that makes me actually more excited um, than about the future. Of course, just a quick point. You know, the campaigns we run for more funding for local government, more funding for the counties, and we write, encourage everybody to write to their MPs to lobby, they all lobby Rishi. And so uh, he's been a very busy person at the start of this financial year, and we got that extra 165 million. Uh, and the uh, good news that was uh, in the recent uh, uh, budget uh, announcements for local government. And uh, you know, on all our behalves, I should have said it when I introduced you, we're enormously grateful for the uh, energy and effort and hard work you put into getting uh, that result for us. I said to James yesterday, we put our case, you listened and you acted upon it. And uh, thank you again for that. Right, I'm going to move down this side and then come back down this way. Lady with the orange uh, uh, coat on. Um, is there a second one there uh, on that side? And Martin in the corner. Please. Uh, Theresa Heritage, Deputy Leader, Hertfordshire County Council, and I have um, Children's Services portfolio. Um, can I ask you, um, welcome to hear the word prevention, music to my ears, early help is a very important strand for Hertfordshire. We, um, have, in the, of, we have the Troubled Families uh, Funding, which is essential for our Families First programme, Early Help Front Door. But it's sustainability. My officers keep saying to me, do we know if we're going to get something like that again? How can we plan? 
Will we know about that soon, or do we have to wait for the review? Right, and let's take Martin as well, please. Thanks very much. Martin Ted, leader of Buckinghamshire County Council. And again, echoing what Paul said, it's good to have a true friend of local government in that role that you have now. Um, I wanted to ask about business rates. Um, the Secretary of State yesterday, when he was here, made a big point about the devolution of 75% of business rates down to local government, which sounds great. The trouble is it's not free money. It comes with responsibilities. Um, and also, of course, when you look at the structure of business rates now, the decline, rapid decline of the high street, the growth of the internet economy, uh, to what extent do you think the, uh, if I can say it in these terms, you know, business rates might be a little bit of a poison pill for local government? You know, what is the future of the business rate system uh, given the structural changes in the economy going forward? Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, I, sorry, I didn't catch your name, the lady from Hertfordshire. Thank you. Um, and thank you for mentioning prevention. It's something that I'm very passionate about. And as I said, the work I've seen that you all do really has moved me and just reinforced to me the importance of your local connection and your communities. Now, you're absolutely right. The Trouble Families Programme is funded through 2020, you know, which is the end of the spending review period. It, it will require, I think, the spending review for us to actually figure out what should come next in that regard. You know, what I'm very clear is between now and then, you know, I very much want to put a strong case to the Treasury, and I know the Secretary of State feels the same way, about the importance of prevention in general and the Troubled Families Program. So I'm in the process of collecting a lot of data and information so I can show that this is working on the ground. Of course, it sounds like a wonderful program, and you know, people can get behind it, but you know, when we're coming to talk to the Treasury about funding it, we need to have more than good intentions. We need to have hard fact about the, the difference it's making and the money that it's saving. So we're in the process of collecting that in quite a rigorous way. I'm hopeful that will help make our case, but as it will probably have to wait for the spending review for us to figure out what should come, uh, what should come next. Uh, Martin, thanks for the question. And it's, a, you know, it's, a very, it's an excellent question, and obviously, the just changing structure of our economy is having impacts not just uh, for you in terms of business rate retention, but more generally you know, for the government as a whole. Obviously, the Treasury is primarily responsible for the tax system. They're in the process of various different reviews of digital, the digital economy and how that's impacting our tax base and how we should respond to it. So it'd be wrong for me to prejudge the outcome of that. I think, look, I think in the short term, we, you know, we're still able to make very good progress on 75% uh, devolution. Yes, it comes with the responsibilities, but the flip side is you get to keep 75% of the growth, which I think is, is the valuable part. It's fiscally neutral at the start, it has to be. That was the, the deal that was set out. But having a greater chunk of the growth that you get to keep locally, I think is a very powerful uh, incentive and a reward for all the work you're doing. Uh, but you're right, we should keep an eye on it. Uh, it. You know, Funding local government through business rates obviously has its positives, but as you point out, we need to make a, keep an eye on the business rate base. Uh, you know, I think the pace of evolution on business rates is probably not as fast as people imagine it to be, and obviously the system is designed to be fiscally neutral at a revaluation, so in that sense, the money it raises is fixed in real terms. Uh, but clearly, the types of businesses that are bearing the burden changes, and I think we need to be careful about making sure that those over time are not diverging so much that what you can have an impact on it is removed from what you're keep it, keeping money from. So, uh, you know, I, I think point is well made, the Treasury are looking at it, but in the short term, I think, you know, you all should be, and I'm certainly excited about the prospect of greater business rates devolution, you know, to reward and incentivize everything that you're doing on the ground. Right, now we've got about five or six minutes, so I'm going to move to this side, I can't see any more hands there, two hands on this side, there and there. Hi, Rishi. Um, like you, I'm, I'm new where, to Where are you from, please? I'm Adam Kent from uh, Worcestershire County Council. Thank you. Like you, I'm, I'm new to local government. I got elected last year not having been involved in the public sector at all. Obviously, one of the things that is critical to making sure that we've got our finger on the pulse is data. And I noticed you announced it, I think it was at the Conservative Conference, a certain amount of funds towards improving systems within the county councils. And this is one of the things that I find frankly quite astounding that we're all doing our own thing when effectively you want to see the same data. What can we do towards enhancing a template or a model that allows all of us to drop into something that's cloud-based, current, and allows everybody to see what the current state of play is? Yeah, and the lady at the front from Somerset. Thank you, uh, Mandy Chilcott, Deputy Leader of Somerset County Council. Did you get your name again? Mandy Chilcott. 
Thank you so much, and thanks for your presentation. Um, I, too, am absolutely passionate about social mobility. I live in West Somerset, where our young people came bottom uh, of the country. Libraries, children's centres, level two get set services, funding to advice bureaus, all has been cut totally or reduced in Somerset due to uh, meeting and balancing our budget. Whilst I share your aspirations for social mobility, most uh, services that are statutory do not include a lot of this preventative work. So my question to you is, when talking about the formulae, will you not only include that statutory services and need, but also all the preventative work? Brilliant. Thank you, Adam. Excellent. I completely agree. Those of you uh, who have heard me speak before would have heard me talk about my passion for data and making sure that we can embrace all the opportunities that technology brings. We've recently launched something called the Digital Declaration and alongside that the Digital Innovation Fund. It, it, it's designed to help you undertake the kind of technology projects that you're interested in doing and particularly focus on making sure that you work with each other because as Adam rightly said a lot of what you're all trying to do is very similar so without me imposing some top-down solution on you I think it's absolutely right and sensible that you figure out how to work together to deliver solutions using types of technology today that can be then shared easily amongst all of you so you don't all need to reinvent the wheel so the fund is open for applications i know many of you are involved in that process more generally we're, we're looking at everything we can do to try and help encourage that collaboration and simplify and streamline you know data reporting to ensure that we have the tools that we need uh, and support you in generating the data in a cost efficient manner where as i said if you're all doing something in a similar way, you're all more helpful, helpfully aided by that because you can compare and contrast amongst yourselves. But please do look at the Digital Declaration, look at the Digital Innovation Fund as well. Uh, it's seven and a half million pounds and as I said, it's open right now. Um, you know, Mandy, thank you, David. Nice to see you as well from, from Somerset. Uh, I, look, I, when we come up to the new formula, as I talk about all the individual bits, uh, bits and bobs of it, obviously there's a question around the control totals uh, that you add to all those different pieces. And as a what you know, that will be a question in the, the next round of the consultation. It, and there are different ways to do that. I mean, you could you could look at the average spend that you've spent on the different blocks over the past few years. You could make the argument that some blocks have not received as much attention as they need, and maybe actually you should overweight relative to what you've spent on different areas, maybe a foundation formula that would in, include a lot of those preventative services. So I think that's a fair question, which I would really appreciate your your thoughts on. Um, but more generally, you're right that as demand for statutory services grow, it's often easy to cut prevention because the problems are for tomorrow. I think none of us want to see that. You, you've all tried very hard to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, and as I said, as I'm seeing the good work you're doing with the Troubled Families Programme, I want to take that to the Treasury and say that this is worth investing in. It's worth finding a way to ensure that prevention is well resourced. It, it's not just a, a way to save money down the line, but it's also something that is truly helping some of the most vulnerable people. And I think to the best of our ability, if we can keep doing what we're doing, we'll, we'll be in a good place. Very good. Now, time has run out. I'm told you oh, need to go, so unless there's... Uh, I, you've got I know there was one question oh, that was yeah. texted to me right. uh, about, uh, about, about, uh, about potholes and, <laughs> and taking pictures of potholes. Uh, which apparently was the subject of some of your dinner conversation last night. So, uh, well, you should, you, should, you, should thank, you should thank Carl, but I've spoken to the roads minister this morning on my way here, because I have seen a copy of the letter, which does indeed suggest that you should take pictures of the potholes, which I uh, was surprised about. But uh, anyway, I've had a conversation with the roads minister this morning, and he is, he, uh, you'll be pleased to hear, I'm gonna write, he's asked me to write to him formally so that he can you know, cl clarify in a bit more detail. But you know, his message to me was, you know, don't be too hung up on that sentence. You know, clearly, at, you know, whatever it is, 50 quid to fix a pothole and 420 million pounds, you can do the math. That's, uh, I think, more pictures than certainly the government website could handle. <laughs> uh, but he, I think the sentence Very before good. was what he, he would direct you to, which was the general point about having a note on the website just explaining how you've used the money. You know, clearly, some pictures are helpful as they try and document things. And apparently, that is what they've done in the past. But uh, as, I think in his words, he said, don't, don't overinterpret that second sentence and uh, I will write to him formally to get some uh, clarification and you can put all your you know smartphones and tell all your workers put their smartphones down and just keep going with the shovels and everything else brilliant
Right, Rishi, our time now really has run out. Thank you enormously from all of us for coming, taking the time out to come and talk to us and address our conference uh, today. And thank you for all that you do in local government. We really do have a true friend in a high place. So thank you enormously. Thanks very much. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.